Welcome to the People Property Place podcast with me, your host, Matthew Watts, founder and managing director of Rockbourne. This is a podcast where I share the stories, views, opinions, and career journeys of the movers, shakers, innovators, and leaders in the real estate industry. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast. Today, we welcome Dan Silverman, co-founder at Spacemade to the pod. Hi, Matt. Thanks very much for having me on. Not at all. Well, thanks for, for coming in to uh, the podcast studio. So at Spacemade, you do one thing, enable building owners to deliver flexible workspace directly to customers. We'll get onto Spacemade later in our conversation and unpick exactly what it is that you do. But I always like to start the discussion around how you got into property and, um, and why? Yeah, I've got to be honest, there wasn't really a, like a, 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 a lifelong plan to be in real estate. There were no, no connections in real estate, no family, no work experience in real estate. Um, I sort of found myself actually doing a law degree at, at university because quite frankly, I didn't know what to do at university. Yeah. And, and I thought it sounded impressive. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll go and do that and uh, see where it takes me. So I enrolled on a law degree and I got but midway, everyone starts talking about doing like placements in law firms and getting contracts as trained lawyers. I thought, well, I better check it out to see if it is for me. And I spent a summer, probably my second year at some city law firms and quite quickly I realized it was definitely not for me. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, it was sort of deathly boring, which doesn't mean, you know, it's boring to lawyers. Lawyers, lawyers we love being lawyers. But for me, it was like, it was almost like doing, I guess, like homework all day long and all night long. Yeah. Um, but uh, for, for one or two weeks during that summer, I spent time in a real estate team at one of the law firms and sat in on loads of their meetings. And actually, what the clients were talking about, I thought, wow, that, was, that's, that is interesting. So I came away from that thinking, well, I'm definitely not going to be a lawyer. Um, I wouldn't be a very good lawyer. Um, but this real estate thing could be interesting. So that's kind of where it started. Um, I thought, well, if, we, if you want to get into real estate, I didn't know anything about it. Still be quite good to be a trainee or get on a grad scheme. Half of them had closed. Yeah. Uh, didn't have much experience. I just sent off sort of CVs and applications to the remaining few. And um, I don't really know why, but BMP Real Estate, which was then called Attis Real, part of BMP, going through a bit of a transition. And um, maybe they wanted someone a bit different to the normal person they had before. Um, yeah, they let me in. As a non-cog? So As a not, yeah. So having not done a real estate yeah. master's or an undergrad, you came in having That's done right. a law degree. Yeah, and I remember the night before I started, actually, my dad said to me, um, you know, Dan, do you know what, what a yield is? I was like, what, what nonsense are you talking about? You know, and I literally started with no knowledge. Obviously, there for you know, two years on a rotation scheme. Yeah, non-cog. So they sent me off. And paid for quite nicely, nice of them to pay for a sort of postgraduate degree. Um, so I thought, what could go wrong? You know, it's been two years there, and I'd work out if it was for me or not. Um, and it was, it was great. It turned out well. I had a good time. Met some really nice people. And you, you were at BNP for seven years. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it was quite a long time. So I started in 05. Yeah. And so 05, 07, I was on the grad scheme, and of course I saw, you know, it was the top of the market. You know, and um, spent a lot of time in the city office with some great people. Um, and it was a lot of fun real estate, you know, back then, especially quite heady. And then I sort of qualified and got a place in the city investment development team. And then like the crash happened. Um, and I thought, oh shit, I better just really work really hard and see if I can keep my job. So that was kind of the plan really initially. And you were city investment development for the remaining five years? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Before looking to, to yes, shift? Yes, so... Um, I got some really great exposure and I think the benefit of working at a really large company straight out of university is that you do get early on big exposure, even just being sat in the room. Um, so it was really, it was really cool and I always advise sort of young people if they can, if they can get in, that's great, you should try and do it. But what I, what I, saw, I was quite, I guess, a little bit impatient after a few years and what I kind of realised, there's probably similar at all sorts of big companies. Um, that it's, it's sort of really hard to like make the really big clients your own. Um, you kind of, it's, you kind of got to wait like 10, 15 years. And, um, and I thought, oh, I don't really want to wait that long. And, and as a sort of transactions guy at the time, 
I wanted to sort of just get stuck in and, and work for those big pension funds. Um, you weren't really able to. So it was partly that I was getting a bit frustrated, but also I always had it in me that I wanted to do something a bit entrepreneurial. And I think I'm probably a bit worried that if I left it really long, if you see it happen, you kind of, you end up sort of staying for a lifetime in those types of roles. So I sort of felt like I had to do something and jump off the ship at yeah, some point. Yeah, mortgage, kids, husband, wife, you know, your risk appetite reduces. Yeah, it can do, it can do. So the opportunity came up to, um, I, was, I was working for like a really great guy called Sean Gorvin at the time. He sold his agency business called Morgan Pepper with a couple of other really great people to, to BMP. And he'd done his uh, now and um uh, I think he was sort of ready to do something again. So we decided to sort of set up just a very small niche um, brokerage firm, basically, in the city. Um, that was 2012. Um, and the timing was good because we'd just come out of the kind of the, the, the crisis, the financial crisis. And from sort of 12 for the next sort of three years, four years, you know, we had a, we had a great time. We did deals for, you know, the likes of L&G and M&G and Standard Life, all the big pension funds. But it was, you know, it was... Probably equal measure, exhilarating and nerve-wracking. You know, it's uh, you're working on quite big transactions. If they happen, your year's done. If they don't, you don't have a year. So, it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it was sort of like you know, very exciting as a young person. But actually, you know, I had a decision to make after a couple of years, which was, you know, do I want to grow it to become a you know a, a well-known, hopefully niche agency, and then you sort of you're hiring people and you're committing really to them and to the business for a long period of time. Um, and I think my instinct was that um, that I probably wanted some business where actually it was a bit more kind of long term rather than kind of the transactional side. So that's when I thought actually I needed to finish off my experience, my round my experience off, and probably get a bit of landlord experience, which was kind of what was next. And so moving away from uh, being an investment agent, peddling deals, mm -hmm. you wanted to see through a more strategic. You know, what happens once someone's bought yeah, that's the right. asset and, and, and where, where does the business plan, implementation and execution and value creation come from and then the disposition? That's right, that's cycle. right. I think as an agent, you know, it's, your, your skills is all about you know, finding that deal, finding the right client and, and getting it over the line, which is a real skill set. Um, but then obviously that's, that's your job done. And um, that was really interesting, that the financing of real estate, capital allocation and risk, seeing a plan through. So... Um, I probably always wanted to see what, what that was like and sort of get that experience. And so at the same time I was having those thoughts, a role came up, which was in my sweet spot really, which was Central London Investment for, um, for a property company. So UK and European, now Blue Coast Capital. So you've gone from being in a, a city investment development agent to setting up your own business. So demonstrating kind of quite entrepreneurial tendencies, A, by the line of work and then setting up your own business to moving towards a client side investment management business. Mm -hmm. Sometimes clients talk about wanting to hire entrepreneurial people, but when entrepreneurial people turn up, they regret it. Um, and it can also be quite a difficult jump to move from an advisor in a brokerage firm to the client side. How did, how did that role come about? And how, how did you manage to land it? Yeah. Well, I think, by the way, everything you said is right. I think it is a hard... I think I was employed because of that entrepreneurial spirit and they didn't necessarily want someone who'd have been handed work and actually hadn't necessarily won the work and done the transactions. But yeah, it is really hard going, you know, in, in that environment if you're coming from an entrepreneurial environment. Um, I, I sort of had started a conversation sort of years earlier, actually. And yeah, like a lot of these things, it sort of happens by chance. I kind of knew of them. I knew some of the characters there. And as I was scratching my head about that move, I got a call to say that they were looking for, um, you know, a senior investment guy and... Um, yeah, one thing led to another and it was the right timing for me. Yeah. And so you joined the business in 2000 and you're going to have to help me out here. Oh, it would have been, it would have been, yeah, 16, I think. 16. Yeah, 16. End of, end of 16, being of 17 actually, yeah. And so you ended up doing a couple of years at Blue Coast and did you manage to to run a number of transactions just from the other side of the table and utilise your agency Yeah, I was involved in all sorts of really cool projects. So stuff which they already had in the portfolio, some great development sites, getting planning and asset managing to all sorts of kind of transactions. It was a, you know, they were a small team but involved in deals globally. So it was, it was, it was super interesting to be involved. Um, but actually, I wasn't there for that long. Um, and actually, but it was there that I met my co-founder, Johnny Rosenblatt. And so it's, um, 
you know, he actually came in and did some advisory work for, for, for us there on operational real estate, which is kind of what kind of was the, the, the very beginning is not that we knew at the time of Space Made. So let's, let's move on to kind of Space Made. So, so you met Johnny, your co-founder, as he kind of came into pitch or give some advice mm-hmm. just in terms of some of the projects you're doing. How did that first meeting then evolve to creating yeah. the kind of concept and then the business of Space Made? Yeah, so I was getting more interested in operational real estate. So I'm really an office person in terms of commercial real estate, um, more than any other sector. And I noticed within the real estate portfolio that I was involved in at Blue Coast that the offices were changing. Um, you know, if you put your mind back, you know, we work has educated, uh, you know, the customer, the tenant in a new way of taking space. And it was getting really hard from what I could see for landlords to compete with that level of service. But at the same time, certainly there, we were reluctant to sign the lease to sort of an SPV, to, a, to an operator. We wanted to, I guess, if we could provide those services and compete without necessarily giving up the control of our asset. Um, so I was working on a couple of transactions around operational real estate. And actually, I was introduced by a mutual friend to Johnny, who had actually just exited and sold um, his co-working business called Headspace Group, which was a really cool flex business, but it was on the old way of structuring. So he took leases from landlords and then, you know, created profit above. And, you know, he in 2017, I think he saw that that model probably was, didn't have a huge future. So he'd sold that business and was sort of scratching around for the next thing. And actually, yeah, so he came in for three months and... I think it both dawned in us, not immediately, obviously, but it dawned in us that actually the issue that I was having at that company must be shared across the industry. And actually, there's a major problem and could we find a solution? And I think when you, you know, as I said before, I kind of always felt I wanted to create something of scale rather than just a brokerage thing. And actually, when you, I think you come across a problem that you think you might be the right people to solve and it's scalable, then... Um, yeah, if, if it's in you, then you want to you want to try and do it. You want to tackle it. So at the time, yeah, typically occupiers had the option of taking a traditional lease five years plus, doing all the fit out themselves, or going to a WeWork or a Tog, and working on a in a lounge or on a flexible basis. And those businesses were probably moving towards trying to attract more. 20 or 10, 20, 30 people occupy space. So you thought that there was an angle to A, own, own the assets and manage it yourself or provide a, a service for those yeah. businesses that owned their own assets but didn't have the know-how or the expertise how to, um, to operate it day to day. Yeah, so it's massively the latter. We basically, we actually looked at like other real estate markets and sectors and actually we looked at like the hotel world in a lot of detail because what you've got in the hotel world is you've got asset owners, building owners, and then you've got operators. And the vast majority of the hotel world are based on management agreements. Yeah. They have the skills to operate, and they've got the infrastructure. The guy that owns the building or the fund or the property company, he's got the capital he's buying, but he's not in any way wanting to operate it. So we figured that you've got loads of landlords, they're gonna want something that's right for their asset, right for their business plan, but they know they're capital allocators and they're brilliant at buying assets, but are they going to build an operational business, which is quite a different business, it turns out, yeah. which you need scale and you need expertise and, and tech. So um, we wanted to build something. Well, we had two, when we got together, we said we promised each other two, two things we we're going to do in this company. One is, is create a great culture of great values we, we felt was lacking in the real estate industry. And the other one was something very scalable. So we didn't go down the asset route. Um, asset heavy route um, because quite frankly you know there is a there's a speed to, to, to scale uh, so someone like Fora and Brockton probably took that route is that fair yeah I think they took that route but they obviously wasn't solving the problem that we were trying to solve either yeah quite you know if you want to solve a problem for a, a building owner then you you know obviously you're not going to buy assets you're going to help them so yeah but that's right I think those guys obviously got fantastic businesses owning the real estate and actually then you get control as well so I think that's perfect but for those people that aren't, weren't going to you know do that um, we thought we could create an asset light business based on operating agreement so that's that's kind of what we did and that's what we do and from a from a kind of a how did you go about having created the business idea minimal viable product mm-hmm. how did you go about funding it rolling it out and and setting it up fundamentally yeah that's a great question I think 
you know, th- th- day one, it was literally just Johnny, me, and, and we took a, a very bright uh, person on to sort of be the third person in the room as our first employee. We, we took an office. We had, we had a whiteboard, we had the problem, and we were like, right, we kind of got an idea of the solution, but how's it going to work out? So it was, you know, it was really startup, startup. Um, but we basically took the view that we had to start with entrepreneurial landlords because we felt whilst Johnny had a great track record in co-working space, I had quite a few connections into the institutional real estate world that actually we needed to test the product and we needed to have a case study for the big property companies institution. So we purposely just basically were very focused on getting our first couple of buildings operating. And actually this model, I guess the biggest challenge is getting from zero to one. Yeah. And I think that's because the old model of taking a lease as an operator, you've got to convince the landlord you're going to pay them rent. And actually, if the landlord doesn't have many options, as we've seen in the last 10 years, more often than not, they're going to say, yeah, go for it. Go, yeah, I'll give you a lease. You pay me rent. Good luck. Yeah. This model flips on their head. Landlords are paying us to operate the services on, an op- on a profit share arrangement, but they're taking you know, much more of a risk. So actually, to get going, to get your first five spaces, get 10... We haven't got anything is really hard. So those first two years, uh, or those first year, was all about kind of getting going. Um, and then, of course, COVID hit. So your first site was Queen's Park. Is that right? Yeah, we had two at a similar time, actually. So I think that actually the first first one was a building in Leeds that we still operate, um, which a, uh, a consortium of private investors and investment company, investment property companies bought. It was an already trading serviced office building, quite tired, um, quite, quite, quite generic. So they brought us in kind of on acquisition to rebrand it, reposition it and operate it for them. Uh, that was in Lee City Centre, it's called Park House. Um, and, and then yes, we've got, we had a space that we launched uh, in the middle of COVID, June 2020. Um, in Queen's Park as we felt that we kind of always liked the suburb markets and of course they've come roaring uh, because of flexible working and people working close to home but yeah that's one of that was one of our first as well and and you're probably more likely to find um, yeah a high net worth or consortium or smaller property companies owning space that isn't being optimized effectively in those more suburban locations rather than prime central London um, initially to prove the concept yeah I think that's right and look those guys are often they're the sort of people who are usually slightly ahead of the curve that will, um, they can see the market move and they will be the first ones to react to it. Yeah. You know, really super smart um, operators in the market. Um, and yeah, and that's right. You know, they've got the sort of assets that they were happy for us to, um, and, and they knew us, you know, they knew our background. So they trust us, you know, that what we do, you need an amount of trust. And now we've got, um, you know, much gr- a growing portfolio and loads of live locations we've got all the data points and people can come and look at it and see full spaces. So actually it gets so much easier when you've got all that. But back then, of course, we didn't have all that. It was based on reputation and believing in, in us and what we were trying to achieve. So you had to build the, the operational infrastructure. You convinced the, the landlord to allow you to operate it. Do you also have to go out and get the tenants as well? Is that part of your... Yeah, we, yeah we, we operate absolutely end to end. So we build a full operation infrastructure that the very best operators on leases will, will have. So everything from we have in, in-house interior design, project management, all the way through to finance operations, tenant sales, marketing, fantastic team. Um, it's completely end to end. So the landlord doesn't have to do anything, but it's their, their, it's their operation. They see everything. You know, we've got this amazing dashboard that Nick and our team built, where a landlord can log in every day and see everything. The, the tenancy schedule as one member might join or leave, the full PNL linked to the budget, everything. So it's very much transparent. It's very much the PNL of the landlord, but absolutely all done by us. So all hands off, they can, they can trust you to get the building fully operational yeah. as quick as possible. And then sit back and check all the data points and see how it's... Yeah, absolutely. Actually. And they can be involved as well. Like, you know, we create, we create micro brands for every location. It's all linked to within the SpaceMay network on the, on the SpaceMay website marketplace. But we often involve the landlords in a lot of that decision making. And also, you've got to remember, 
you know, we're working with some, you know, big developers and institutions. You know, we signed a deal with uh, CBREIM on, on Brinley Place, uh, 10 Brinley Place, which is 200,000 square feet. And it's all about integrating the flexible space in their development. Because what those developers don't want is to then carve off a, a floor or two to an operator with their brand. And, they, and, and it might be on a management agreement, it might be on a profit share, but essentially it's the operator's customers and it's their space. What we're finding is that more and more developers and owners of assets and funds, they want to integrate the flexible workspace into the, um, into the customer journey of all the tenants in the space. So if you've got a traditional floor of 20,000 square feet, let to a law firm, you want them to be able to use that flex space. You want them to be able to use the meeting rooms. Um, and therefore, you need control and transparency on that flex space. And from a pricing perspective, is it universally priced across all your space or does the landlord set the pricing for the customer coming in? Yeah, so that each location has its own business plan. Um, and that's super important because we create like the, the right space, that's from look and feel to pricing, for that location and that business plan. So you know, we've got spaces as diverse as on the Strand in central London um, to, to Leeds to London Field. They, they attract a very different customer who wants a very different experience. It has to be absolutely top notch across that experience, but, but a different experience and therefore a different price point of different location. So we work with the landlords and, and you know, quite frankly, the landlords, they are they are signing long-term agreements with us because they kind of want us to lead on all that pricing and tell them. Yeah. Um, and to a certain extent, educate them about the market. You know, they love seeing the model, the cash flow, you know, what does everything cost, the coffee beans. They love seeing it because up until now, they've been cut out of that market. It's all been within the operator, even as a tenant. So absolutely, we love landlords being involved, having a look in, but ultimately they're leaving it up to us in terms of, you know, how it actually operates. Yeah. So you've just... Um opened your 10th location. Um, like you said, you built out your teams and your infrastructure. Are you able to just give me a quick snapshot of Space Made right now and then what the plans are um, for the future as well? Just yeah, so Space Made right now, yes, we've, we've, we've signed our uh, 10th location um, with another, another sort of almost five that we'll be signing in the coming uh, sort of weeks and months. Um, so we're growing. It's all about, for us, okay, we've got to a, a size now where we've proved the concept um, and it's about scale. You know, scale because the bigger the network, the better it is for the end customer. Yeah. Because actually I think what some of the big global operators have, uh, and what they've done really well, is scale. Now they've done it on a sort of cookie cutter approach, which is absolutely fine. The same way there's a great market for Premier Inn, Travel Lodge um, and Hilton. But actually what we're building is something a little bit different, which is scale. We want to get to 60 locations, uh, which we're on track for in the next three years, um, because it's great for the end customers to be able to drop into different locations. It's great for the landlords because actually you can attract those customers that want to pay good desk prices because there's the network. Uh, and as for us as a business, if you're growing a scale business to attract the talent, you need to be a business that's got a vision and growth. Um, and actually, now we've got to a point of, as you said, ten plus locations. It's just about it's just about scaling, attracting the right, the very best talent into the business. So for you, it, it, you will be competing, no doubt, with the businesses like GPE or Land Securities or British Land who are building their own product. You'd be going to those businesses and say, "Don't bother building your own product. Give that hassle to us. We'll take it off your your hands." And we will be able to give you full transparency and visibility over the operations and you'll be able to have full responsibility for, or not, we'll have full responsibility for it. So are you trying to now move away from smaller, more entrepreneurial uh, buildings in peripheral locations to work with bigger, larger landlords with more footprint across the UK? Both. Absolutely both. So what we're building is our locations that are close to home and city centres. And we think that's absolutely fundamental because flexible working, in our view, is not going away. You know, we don't think that the majority of people who are working two to three days in a city centre are going to go back to five days. And actually, the demand to have choice um, across both those locations is paramount. Uh, so we, we've somehow become the largest operator of close to home workspaces in London. And we're growing the city centre uh, portfolio rapidly as well. 
So we want both. We want to work with both, um, quite frankly. Um, and, and we've, you know, our last um, space that we announced uh, recently uh, in Putney was with a private property company and we'll absolutely continue to do those deals. I think um, partnering with the major institutions uh, adds something else to us, which is um, you know, the, the, sort of the, the trust that if people like the CBRA IMs, the Whittington Investments, the Southern Housing Groups, signing 10-year management agreements, um, you know, it's, 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 it's something to be, that we're really proud of. And we hope to do great jobs and do multiple locations for those same um, platforms. So what you, you touched on the kind of the flexibility piece there and working, working from home, working in office city centres or more suburban locations. What's the data saying or what would the kind of typical customer, you know, occupy journey be? What their, you know, what would their day be like? Do you have any visibility on what the data says? Yeah, look, I think we're in a slightly unique position, actually, because we've got, as I said, quite a few of these close to home workspaces in London, on the Queen's Park, Cricklewood we've just launched, Wimbledon we've launched you know, a couple of months ago and is pretty much full. And, you know, we've, we've got those data points. It's, it's super interesting. Um, but what's it telling us? I think it's telling us that um, there are a huge number of people that want to work close to home. I mean, to put some data behind it, you know, that portfolio is at 90%, 92% occupancy, um, you know, which is staggering, and some of them are 100%. So, you know, the demand is there. Um, I think it's really interesting to look at the days of the week people are coming in, or the suburb spaces versus city centre spaces. You know, when the city centre spaces, you obviously see that Monday, Friday, massive drop off. Yeah. Whereas the suburb spaces, it slightly reduces, but nothing like that. So, look, we, we do have some interesting data. We love talking to our landlords about that. Um, I don't know. I think there's data in the market, uh, not the real estate market, about flex, flex, you know, flexible working. And like, I was reading the other day that 84% of workers who had to work from home during COVID say that they're always going to work a mixture now. And But, you know, quite frankly, you don't even need that data. Just look at your friends, your family, yeah. yourself. I mean, the, in the real estate world, it does make, it does make me laugh because... There obviously is a, there's a very vocal crowd of you've got to work from the office the whole time. And I think when your salary depends on it, I totally get it. But that's just not the reality. The reality is that there is a great, there's a great benefit to working in an office. There's also a great benefit of not commuting all the time as well. Yeah. So what we're trying to do as a business is provide both. Um, and I think that's the beauty now of this network that you can go and drop into a close to home workspace some days a week and a city centre on the other days. Just moving on to, you know, you've, you, am I right to say you've got a team of 18 at the moment? I think at last count, yes. Last count. So your headcount plans and projections are going to grow as you scale the platform. Mm. What, what have been your learning so far just around recruitment and, and talent attraction and getting people on board? It's expensive. Well, is it a cost or is it an investment? <laughs> I mean, a recruitment fees. Yeah, recruitment fees. Um, but in terms of getting people into your business, yeah. you know, I don't know if you've had mishires or um, just be interested to know yeah. what your, look, what your I, view. I, I, it's for us that we're a service provider. Um, the, the, the tech piece is really crucial and it's a really big part of what we do. But the people and the operation we build is fundamental. I, I think we are, I think, I think there's two things going on. I think we are in a very active part of the market. So the flex space is doing, I think, considerably better than some other areas of the market. Um, so I think it is, you know, it's competitive. But you know, I think one thing that Joy and I, speaking on his part as well, are most proud of is the culture that we're building. And I, you know, we're having worked at various organisations, you know, all you know, great businesses, but we're trying to build a sort of culture that we think is far better than exists in the real estate industry. And they said, for example, yeah, we value transparency like beyond anything. And that goes with our team, with the end users and with our landlords, like that dashboard. Um, we, we completed a, a fundraise recently and we uh, closed it off. And then Johnny and I pitched to the whole business, to, all, to every single person in the business. Um, and, and really the reason for that is transparency because we said to them, our investors are here on this journey with us and we want you to be brought in this journey. So 
that's super, super important. So look, I think when we've been trying to attract people, that does help having the right culture. And, um, and then I think to get the best talent, you've basically got to have a great big vision that yep. they can believe in. Because if you are best at what you do in anything, whether it's marketing, um, you know, tenant sales, uh, the lot, actually you, you want to be in the growth business. So we, we've got, you know, we've got to be doing those two things. And at the moment we are, and, you know, thankfully we're hiring some great people. What does the, um, the future of Space Made look? You've got very grand ambitions and no doubt international expansion um, would have crossed your mind. What, yeah, what does the future of Space Made look like? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So look, at the moment we are solely focused on the UK market because um, we think it's a massive opportunity. You know, we think we can get to our 50, 60 locations just in the UK over the next couple of years. Look, I've, I, we, I've seen plenty of businesses that have spread themselves too thinly and go global because, it, you know, it, it, it can be inviting, you know, to think that actually there's really other big markets out there. I think it's a risk. I think if you can put it off, brilliant, but I think it's a risk. I think for us right now, you know, we, we've established a fantastic operational platform in the UK. There is a huge amount to do. So we're solely focused on that. And as you said, that the, you know, what we built um, is scalable because we're not taking onerous leases um, uh, that require massive capex. So it is scalable and it does, it would translate to other locations and territories, but that's not for right now. Fine. What, what is it about the property industry that you love and keeps you, um, keeps you here from, from starting off in a, in a law degree and not really understanding the real estate world per se? Certainly, uh, you'll know what a yield is now. But what, what is it about the, the real estate industry that you love? You know what? I think I love it more now than I probably loved it at the beginning, if I'm honest. Um, I think when I joined the industry, I was probably a bit surprised about, in some areas, you know, it was more fun than analytical or customer focused that I thought it might be. And look, the real estate industry is vast. You know, you can be a banker, an agent, yeah, designer. So it, it's big. I guess in the in the more in the area that I have specialised in, in in the office world, it's changing. I think more now than it ever has. And actually, what I love about it now is the customer focus. And I think that was lacking before. I think what I found frustrating was all about transaction. Can I buy? Can I can I somehow get a ten lease and can I flip it? And I look, you know, there's always going to be that in the market, but. I think for me that wasn't as interesting or exciting as I necessarily wanted it to be. I, know, I think I love probably uh, building a business as much as I love real estate. And I think if I fell into, I like to think, if I fell into like insurance or, or whatever, I'd be doing something hopefully entrepreneurial there. Look, I think real estate is a great opportunity for so many people now because it is, it's, it's changing for our eyes. Yeah, that sort of valuation, rent reviews, all that stuff's changing. It is coming super operational. We look at, look at Resi, look at PRS, look what's happening in retail. It's become an experience, turnover, revenue, partnerships. It's all changing and I think it needs a different skill set. I think it's probably one of the most exciting periods to go into, but I think it's a risk for some of the businesses, but the opportunity is there. In terms of advice, what advice would you give someone entering into the real estate world now? As someone who has come in and has reinvented yourself one way or another throughout your career and certainly at the forefront of um, the flexible workspace um, journey what advice would you give to someone coming in now coming in now um, and then maybe someone who's looking to to leave a traditional mm. real estate um, career um, look I think my what I said initially still stands true which if you can get big broad experience up front I think it's great so I, I, I think they there's still a vast amount of the real estate market working on the older on the older model so I would be pretty careful about trying to emulate what's gone on before I think you've got to work with people that you think are doing something innovative something interesting something exciting for the future I think the last thing that you probably want to do is work with people that are hanging on to the old um, but also I think you've just got to know yourself and I think you need to know what you, you, is going to excite you so obviously I've taken you know I, I, 
I, I sort of invested my time as an employee. I worked you know, super hard, but actually I knew deep down I had to go and do something a bit entrepreneurial. And for me, you know, it was probably scarier not to, to think, oh, I'm just going to be sort of sat here for 30 years, which is, which is not a bad thing. It, yeah, and, and actually, I think if you know that's probably best for you, then I think it's all about finding a great business that you can add value to, work with great people. Uh, and if you add value, you know, you'll do very well. I think if you have that itch inside you to do something entrepreneurial, then I think there's never been a better time. Um, and, it, and you know what, as a, as a young person, there's always the balance between, and you must see it, I guess, like being super ambitious and, and impatient and, and it's getting that balance right. You know, I mean, I think I, I had three roles before I set up Space Made, you know, from, I mean, an eight, seven year, four and two, like, all CVs I see now, I think a year and a half is quite. It's considered a long period of time now. So. That's a bit sharp. Maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. Maybe but a years. Yeah, it's that, it's definitely that balance between patience and um, ambition. Yeah. You know, and it and it's that that balance between you know putting the reps in um, and becoming a real master of your your craft, and um, but but not settling as well, and making sure you're in the right environment. Yeah. In terms of um, you and Johnny's relationship, how how do you manage the two different? Um, how do you manage that relationship? And have you segmented your roles and responsibilities? And do you focus on one area of the mm -hmm. business, and does he focus on another area? Yeah, look, we've had to as we've grown. I mean, right at the beginning, we did everything together. You know, we were we were a sort of tiny little startup, and we're still you know we're still very much a startup. But as we've grown, especially over the last eighteen months. Um, we, we, yeah, we absolutely do, you know, take responsibility on a day-to-day -day basis for different parts of the business. And we sort of leaned into, I guess, uh, our experience and what kind of we, you know, what we, what we enjoy. So you know, Johnny is a phenomenal operator. Um, he is fantastic at, at kind of the end customer experience um, and design. And I like to think I've got enough experience on the sort of landlord side to work on those partnerships, those those initial meetings, those pitches, the finance, the legal structures, and and on the operational side of the business as well. So, yeah, we have our we've we've we have segmented. We are hopefully um, dividing the workload, uh, but ultimately, you know what? Every day there's another challenge. Um, every day brings a different set of challenges and. and growth and excitement and quite frankly you know we're, we're, we're speaking to each other seeing each other all day long so a lot of it is uh, is shared at the moment well you you launched your business in in covid or during covid um and we both know the the news and the the economic headwinds that are being banded around what are your views on the market at the moment um given the noise um yeah, look, I, my sense is not to be too pessimistic on, I guess, the capital market, but, you know, we do see, I think every decade or so, a, a sort of repricing and you never quite know why and how and how it's going to come about. But look, we're in for a, a period of, re of adjustment. I mean, you can call it adjustment, but it could be more than that. Um, you know, I think there's a bit of a perfect storm out there for, for certain parts of the market. I mean, if you look at take offices, for example, You've got more vacant space than I think we've had since 09. I think in London, but something like 15 million, if I remember rightly, for the stats out recently. Um, so you've got your structural change. You know, that's due to tenants not needing much space anymore or flexible working. So that's a massive structural change happening right now. And retail's had that, you know, five, you know, within the last five years. And so officers have got it now, but at the same time, They've also got um, a sort of a, a an energy efficient kind of cliffhanger um, where you know in the next five to seven years a lot of uh, buildings aren't going to be fit for purpose and tenants won't take them. So you've got a structural change and people have you know, people are working need different office space space that's inviting and that's um, got a community and got events and is easy to move in and out. So they're not going to want a lot of the old traditional stuff. You've got this ESG thing, which I think renders a huge amount of the market unusable. And then you've got a, um, 
a, 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 a looming recession with interest rates moving higher and higher and that will clearly have a knock-on effect for yield so i think there's there's a ton of issues for the space but there's always but that always creates opportunity I mean, we saw it in 09 you saw, always seen it's you know for those that are you know well capitalized and have a sense of the future that that will be the opportunity like always but there'll be some pain yeah so i ask everyone on the, on the podcast as we kind of draw to a to a close yeah. Um, and I appreciate you're not a, a, an investment or a, an individual who works in an investment uh, private equity firm as such. But if you were given £500 million pounds worth of equity, or if you were given um, uh, a resource that would really complement SpaceMade, who are the people, what property and, and which place um, would you be looking to deploy that? Gosh, um, God, there's a lot there. Uh, Matt. Um, Dead or alive, <laughs> you know, right. um, mentors. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm probably slightly talking my book here, or my, or my answer before I think is linked to this, which is, I think the opportunity is where people are exiting. And I think, you know, we know logistics has been the hottest market for, you know, the last decade. And the office world is probably unloved. I, I think that's where the biggest opportunity is going to be. Um, so if I had, yeah, if, if you give me 500 million pounds of equity, I'd be looking to be buying office buildings, city centres and suburbs, of course, um, that are owned by, owned by the last generation of owners. And that could be private individuals or funds who actually are saying no thanks to real estate or offices anymore because we actually love the bond like stuff that used to be what we bought. And it's really either short income or it's operational. It's not for us anymore. Those guys, I think, are going to have to sell at some point or want to. Um, and there's going to be people that won't necessarily want to reinvest in the assets for the ESG coming up. So I think it's going to be brilliant opportunities. And I think you've got to operate. Who would I give the money to? Um, look, I think there's some great businesses out there. Look, I think, I mean, look, look, take someone like a Blackstone, for example. You know, I love thematic investing. I like trying to read the big structural shifts coming into the market. You know, things like retirement living, I think has got a really interesting future, uh, PRS. But I think people like them, they pick a theme and then go really, really long with it and create a platform, an operating platform. So uh, I, I think there's probably other people out there as well. Um, but ultimately, look, I think... If you now now is the no, the moment to have that money, um, but it's harder than before. It's harder. It's not just going to be about buy low, quickly move on. I don't think. I think it's going to involve a whole lot more. Well, Dan, thanks so much for um, coming on the podcast today. We um, really enjoyed working with you and supporting you, and looking forward to um, watching you grow Space Made um, further. Thanks very much, Matt. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the People Property Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague, subscribe, give us a rating, like or comment. It helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations of which guests you think we should get on the podcast or areas of the market that we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People Property Place podcast is powered by Rockbourne. The team recruit experienced talent for real estate private equity firms, investment managers, REITs, property companies, and advisory firms across the investment, asset management, development, fund management, ESG, cap markets, investor relations, and general practice space. So if you're considering your career options at the moment or looking to attract top talent to come and work for you, head over to the website, www.rockborn.com, where you can find a wealth of resource to aid your search. Have a great day wherever you are, and I look forward to catching you next time.